Hello everyone and welcome to our very special 2023 Mental Health Awareness Week podcast. My name is Smai Rahimi and I am the UK Wellbeing Manager and today I am so honoured to be sitting opposite, virtually of course, um, opposite a very very special colleague Andy Forsyth but I'm going to let Andy introduce himself. Hi Andy. Hello, thank you very much. It's really kind and it's good to speak to you. Um, so my name is Andy Forsyth. Um, I've, um, I'm 50 year old. Um, I've been in Computer Centre over 13 years and um, I've um, had a bit of a journey with my mental health and um, at currently at the moment um, I've um, gone from being possibly the worst I've felt in my life 12 months ago and I now feel the best that I've felt for over 40 years and we decided we'd have a bit of a chat about that didn't we? Absolutely. And I know we've we've spoken a few times and I know the ins and outs of your recovery, of your journey, but I would love for you to tell the listeners, how did it all start? Where was the beginning of your journey? So if I step back a, a long, long time ago, because everybody's got a bit of a life story and the way that we 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 grow up and we shape ourselves becomes really um develops our, our mental well-being, our, our, our culture, our beliefs, and uh, and the way that, that we, we become ourselves. Um, you know, there is a there's a really good saying that is we think what we become. And um, I grew up uh, in, in, in Lancashire and I was um, I was pushed very, very hard as a as a child um, through private education, um, university, and it was um, the culture of my family was achieve, 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 achieve. You must do better for yourself. And I've actually spent a lot of time and I've looked back at this and I've actually drawn my life map. And, and that's really where I started to uh, to suffer in that um, um, I developed um, a mindset where nothing was good enough. And, um, and I became very critical on myself and um really because i was getting a lot of criticism around me that you must do better you must do better and um that really made me very very anxious at a, as a young person growing up through my teens um, at times i was getting quite depressed and um i used to beat myself up as a result of that very very badly and i've been my own worst critic um it develops into quite a, um, a, a difficult period of time when I went on to university. Um, and that's when I first started seeking support and therapy from the first time I ever met student counsellors. And I actually remember um, talking to my, my parents about that and they were quite shocked that their son would need anything like that because the attitudes they were growing up with was um, you just need to shape up and get on with it sort yourself out that way and we've heard that lots and lots of times particularly as men um, where we're told to man up you know be a man take the lead and um, it's where a lot of men fall down particularly the the, the stage that there are in their lives um, particularly middle-aged men now we know that they are a um, one of the highest uh, target group, one of the highest groups for suffering from mental health issues, be it anxiety, depression, um, other other disorders. I've also suffered as well through for years with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, which is um, everybody sort of has this sort of in, in, in impression of OCD as being I'd like to do a lot of cleaning or. You know, you fold your sandwich wrappers a particular way. Uh, it's quite some of those, but not to a particularly extreme view. But you know, a little bit of OCD can be very, very good in people. It, it makes us process orientated, which is what we do in Computer Center. Um, it also um, makes sure that we're organised and it helps us through our day to day. But um, when those thoughts start to become um, obsessive. And, and dangerous 
they cause you angst and, and anxiety. That's when it becomes a problem. And mine's developed from various scenarios and um, and different um, different um, in different situations to becoming quite 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 dangerous for me in that when I get in a car now, I feel that I'm going to crash the car or I'm going to cause somebody some um, an accident. Uh, I have a really strange behaviour with elastic bands in that. Um, and I laugh about this, it's great. Um, and probably all your listeners now are going to walk around their neighbourhoods looking at the pavement, looking for elastic bands. That the, My postman leaves them everywhere. And everywhere I go, I look for elastic bands and I think they're going to be, uh, be harmful. So uh, I have a whole bag of them at home that I go around picking up because I think they're going to poison dogs or or cause danger to people. And I've actually had to have people remove them before. <laughs> it's crazy. You got to laugh about it. And, you know, laughter is one of the best medicines. But um, from, from coming out of university and moving into a professional life, um, that continual beating myself up and not being able to achieve uh, what I wanted to achieve um, and suffering through through stress and working in stressful situations. Um, I'm, I work, I've worked in the technology in, industry since I was uh, since I left university at 22 in different environments, different 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 sort of environments, be it in utilities, you know, money markets, services and solutions like we do now for computer center. Um, the technology industry is a, is a very stressful industry to work in and, and that stress has, has affected me at several several points where my mental health has, uh, has, has dropped to such a level that I've had to step back and, um, and assess what I'm doing and put solutions in place. Andy, can I just um, stop you for a moment and just go back to your childhood? I mean, everything you've just talked about I know a lot of people can resonate with um, and I can certainly resonate with the whole parents not understanding mental health. How did you, because you said that you, you saw a, a student counsellor, which was, which we will come on to one of your first sort of forays into counselling and therapy um, that goes, that's gone on throughout your adult life, even up until today. Um, how did your I know you said your parents were quite shocked, but how did you, did you sit them down and say to them, look, I, I need help, I need support, this is what I'm going through? Were they supportive afterwards? Um, I did, I did sit them down, I did say that, and I did cry for help, and it was just completely dismissed. I had an episode about 20 years ago where, um, well, mid thirties, in my early thirties, and um, I um, I'd been to see a doctor, and I'd taken my mother with me because my uh, uh, obsessive thoughts um, and my mind was working overtime, and um, I was depressed. I had that anxiousness that every day I was getting up, and I was feeling um, fear inside me, and uh, anxiety is a is a horrible horrible illness. Um, yes, anxiety keeps us alive. It stops us from walking across a road in front of cars. So there is good anxiety, but when anxiety is taking over you, uh, it's, a, it's a horrible thing um, to suffer from. I remember taking my mother to see a GP with me and I was explaining to the GP how I was feeling. And uh, the GP did what GPs normally do, which is um, prescribe you some medication. And I was given a course of antidepressants and um, I walked into the chemist afterwards and um, I got my medication and I sat in the car with my mother and my mother said to me, um, Andrew, she's the only person who calls me Andrew, <laughs> said, um, we don't really need those in this family, do we? And took, actually took them off me, which was probably the worst thing she could have done for me at that time. So that's how it was seen. And families do see mental illness as a, as a as a failing in people absolutely you know, we, you know yeah. we we break our leg it's quite obvious isn't it that we've got a plaster on our leg and we've got a bandage there or you know you're, you're using cr cr crutches or or some other device to help you but because there's something wrong in our head and because there isn't about necessarily a bandage on it people don't appreciate that 
there is a bandage on it. There's a different type of bandage on there, be it therapy, um, support that you can get from other people, changing your own ways that you can you can work, um, bringing things into your life to support you. And um, that's the ba different bandage, but it's not necessarily seen and it's not there permanently. I want to ask you when that pivotal point was in your adult life that you realized, okay, this is really serious. I I need to step back and I need to take that time out. Um, I know you've had a stint in rehab, is that correct? Yeah, I um I entered um I went to a psychiatric hospital. Um actually 12 months, pretty much 12 months ago. Um, I actually left hospital 347 days ago. I write all the days down in my book. And uh, so I've got a full record of how long it's been since I left, left hospital. And I'm quite proud of that. And but, so um, you should be. Absolutely. Yeah, 18 months ago, I got to a, a, a low point. Um, I was feeling that I didn't necessarily contribute. And I didn't thought that I might not be better being here for my, my for, for for other people and um i uh i made a conscious decision that i wanted to change and i wanted to stop my mind racing i wanted to try and um gain uh, control over ocd and um, but also can gain control over anxiety depression the way i was i was quite angry inside I was quite in anger from past with anger now i fight anger with non-anger and it's a lot better and it works a lot better. <laughs> uh, I was actually at a meeting about this on uh, on Monday night with a, a, a Buddhist teacher that I uh, I went to and he was explaining that and I could really resonate with it. And um, I had to get worse, unfortunately, before I could start my journey back on, on recovery. I'd recognised there was an issue there and I wanted to recover. But I entered hospital in uh, May last year. Uh, I spent 26 days as an inpatient and um, those 26 days were the most important 26 days in my life. Um, we can all go to therapy, rehabilitation, uh, we can all take medication uh, that gets described by medical professionals. These things are all really, really good, but ultimately you have to work hard yourself to overcome those demons that are within you and I've worked really hard on that and so much so it's almost taken over my life but uh, but I really enjoy it so I've brought lots of new things into my life but also I've had a lot of fun getting rid of things as well and giving things up which is just as important and um, I I think one of, one of I did an exercise and I looked at what my warning signs were and how my warning signs that where I was going from being in a good state to a very, very poor state. And I did like a green, amber, uh, red exercise. And um, I recognised that when I was starting to isolate, um, when I wasn't finding time to relax, when my sleep was disturbed, um, I was getting no energy. I was spiralling from there, comfort eating, um, craving sugar. Often we all do that. Um, a lot of people don't realise that, that that's actually one of the biggest um, yeah. signs of depression and anxiety. Yeah. And I, I suffer from that mm. um, quite a lot. And it's a difficult one to keep under control, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Totally. And then that then lends into a general negative thoughts and general negativity. You know, you don't smile. You don't look after the way you look. Um, you're wearing a nice bright shirt today. And I think colours are really important. If we're all wearing grey and black, then we uh, there's there's no creativity there, and you know and we you know we don't respond to it. Um, but I I've looked at all these sorts of things, and 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 from that I've taken each one of those and looked at how I can prevent getting into that state. So by having a lack of energy and and starting to isolate, you can use the stop technique. Just step back, take a look at yourself. Um, do some breathing, uh, look at all the things around you and focus on the positive things. Journaling has been a massive um, 
uh, thing for me over the last 12 months. Um, I'm now on day 358 of journaling. It's the OCD in here now, the number of days and statistics. And um, every day I start, as soon as I get up in the morning, looking at all the positive things that there are, whether it's sitting in the kitchen, looking at the birds outside in the garden, um, be it um, colours that you can see in the house, be it you feel invigorated because I've got into doing these cold showers that Wim Hof was promoting. I don't know how Fantastic you do that. I tried it life. once. I don't think I can do it again. <laughs> you have to build up a little bit. I started like with five seconds, like, wow, but now you can sit on there for two minutes and it's so invigorating. Also, it boosts your immune system as well. So you can fight off um, all those viruses that we that we live in and are outsiders as well. And, and uh, I've found lots of benefits from that. Um, going for a walk in the morning as well. You know, we talk about mindfulness and mindfulness has been a massive part of my recovery. Um, but mindfulness, when you're when you're going for a walk in the morning, you're looking at things. You're not looking at the floor, looking for elastic bands. You're looking at the birds in the trees. I live in a beautiful part of the world. I live in Anglesey, North Wales, and um, so I, I live on the Maui Strait. So I look at all the birds were swimming in the water. I look at the the tidal flow. I look at all the colours of the sun's glistening off it, and I, and I collect all these thoughts, and that puts you in a good positive state to start the day. Um, Another thing that I've done is I learned this in, in hospital is um, having started to uh, gain and generate um, and use mindfulness techniques. Meditation and the power of meditation has has, has changed my life. Um, I started doing small amounts of meditation in in hospital that we were, we were was was guided meditation, um, and then I progressed to doing that by myself with uh, apps. Uh, we've got a great app in Computer Center that um, that, that you promote. Yeah, um, we do. As part of we the do. employee yeah. assistance program. Um, and um, I've gone from using those now and guided meditations to doing Buddhist meditations, or even just going sitting outside in the garden by myself, lighting a couple of candles, incense sticks my neighbors look over the wall they must be thinking what on earth is he doing at least it smells <laughs> nice <laughs> you know and, and, and this is so far away from the um pull yourself together culture that we were all brought up with that exists amongst people and i'll sit and i'll meditate and i and i clean my mind that way and i do that a couple of times a day um i used the similarly when we were talking about this last week and i said we we get up in the morning we clean our teeth and the last thing we go do before we go to bed is we clean our teeth. Why don't we clean our mind? And if we clean the mind, then the mind can stop taking over. And my racing thoughts and my mind being bombarded by do this, do that. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. Um, and all the pressures that are upon it from home life, work, family, um, your finances, um, exercise that you got your mind is telling you you got to do. All the things that can contribute to. Uh, good and poor mental health um that helps me manage my mind and it's yeah. such such a powerful tool absolutely i i talk a lot about creating healthy habits and i don't just mean eating healthy i think there's there's that misconception it's about you know having healthy thoughts healthy relationships both with ourselves and with those around us as well and sort of you've mentioned stresses um at home and at work i want to know how you were supported when you were going through your recovery and your stint um at the priory as well how were you yeah. supported by your colleagues by your manager by computer center yeah, I must say, Computer Centre were absolutely brilliant. Um, I'd spoke spoken to my my practice lead. Uh, I work in project practice, and I'd spoken to my practice lead eighteen months ago, and I made him aware that I was feeling down, depressed. I wasn't in a particularly good place, uh, and he offered me support. One of the first things he did was send me out the uh, details about the employee assistance program. And I actually contacted one of the counsellors through that and I had four sessions with her, which was really good. And it just reminded me of what I could start to do and start to achieve and, and putting good practices in place. And he was regularly checking up with me on three to every couple of weeks. You OK, Andy? Yeah, I'm fine. 
I'm fine doesn't necessarily mean that you're fine. Yeah. How often do we hear that? You know, uh, when somebody says you're fine, but how are you really? Because really, you know, to get to that next level, and I wasn't fine, but I was hiding that from myself because more a bit of a ashamed and um, um, that I'm a 50 year old man that I should be doing better than that. But we're all a bit soft, aren't we? And, but there's um, absolutely no shame in it. Absolutely. And totally. I think I think the fact that your manager was constantly asking you, it shows that he genuinely cared. Yeah. It He wasn't yeah. just asking you because, you know, he needed to tick a box or, yeah. you know, um, make sure the work is being done because obviously that's important. But when people genuinely care about you and they ask you how you are, I think it really opens up that door for us to really pour our hearts out as much as yeah. you know or as little as we want but there's absolutely no shame in feeling because you know d anxiety depression mental ill health in general doesn't discriminate against gender age you know race it doesn't discriminate at all does it no definitely uh, it could, anybody you could and also we we talk about the signs of of mental health um um having poor mental health and talk about depression you know what do you see in a depressed person yes you might see somebody who's down who's not looking after themselves but equally you can walk down the road and you can walk past somebody and they could look completely normal whatever is normal is there a normal and um they could be suffering from depression anxiety none of us know none of us know which is why we need to talk to each other and ask ourselves and when somebody says how you know how are you and you say you're fine OK, that's great. How are you, how are you actually feeling? And, and expand on that a little bit. And that helped me. Um, so I said earlier, unfortunately, I got I still was going downhill and, and entered, um, entered the Priory in um, in May last year. Um, and again, computer centre were absolutely brilliant. I was worried that I was in hospital and, and I couldn't work and uh, my time, I wasn't able to, you know, I wasn't able to spend the time what I thought I should have been doing, which is delivering projects for computer center um, um again computer center were brilliant they were more concerned about my health than me not being there and um they were didn't just follow up with myself but they followed up with my wife to make she was make sure she was okay and that took a lot of pressure off me um and they were just brilliant computer center was fantastic and amazing absolutely yeah. amazing and i am so proud to have you as part of our mental health first aid mm -hmm. network because you've just recently and i love this i'd never heard of this before but i want to know more about it <laughs> you did your mental health first aid training with are they called mental health motorcycles is that correct mental health motorbike um, motorbike it's yeah. um, so part part of my recovery when I, I i got back to work last year um i was Computer Centre were again fantastic. They they eased me back into work, and they were checking up with me both uh, my line manager and the HR department uh, were checking up on me to make sure I was okay. And um, I took time off in uh, September, some holiday time, and um, this was a real my big step for me. And I got on my motorbike, and I um, went down to the Alps by myself, no support. Camped all the way down through France and Germany into Switzerland, spent a couple of weeks down there and then rode back by myself through France. And I had an absolutely fantastic time. And one of the things that when you're on a motorbike and you stop, people stop and talk to you. Men stop and talk to you. Yeah. You know, yes, there, I don't like stereotypes and I don't do stereotypes, but there is a stereotype with a motorcyclist that it's a you know, a middle aged man starting to live his second life and um, and people come to you and people talk to you. If you go into a car park and you ride in on your motorbike, the first thing you do is you look around for any other motorcyclists that are there and generally you'll strike up a conversation. And mental health and mental health recovery is about striking up conversation. So when I got back, um, I was thinking about this and I thought there must be something um, that or an organisation that can promote mental health uh, well-being with men, with motorcyclists. Um, when you're on your motorbike, we talk, I talked about mindfulness earlier, and um, you're in that moment, you're in that state, 
whilst, whilst I'm still getting the car um, and I've started driving again, which is great, but I still have those anxieties. But when you get on your motorbike, you're a bit more free. You know, there's you and your machine. You're aware of everything that's around you. Uh, you take everything in, all the sights, the sounds, the smells, um, all the things you can taste through the air um, and, um, you know, what you can hear as well. Bare on grounding techniques and fantastic grounding techniques. I practice the five, four, three, two, one, five things to see, four to feel, three to hear, two to smell, one to taste. And I do that on a walk in the morning. Um, but that motorcycle thing promotes mindfulness. And I came across a charity called uh, Mental Health Motorbike. And, and this was set up initially to help men. Uh, to overcome those fears and anxieties that they have about talking about their mental health. Uh, and they're a relatively new charity and they set up quite an aggressive target, which is to um, train up a thousand mental health first aiders in two years. Is that in the UK? Are they UK based? That's in the UK. Yeah. That's across the UK. So mm -hmm. Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England. And um, and I looked at this and 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 it was something that I wanted to get get involved in because when you come through a journey of recovery, one of the things that that can help you is helping others. You know, I've learned to be more compassionate towards myself, and when you're compassionate towards yourself, that's then really when you can start to be more compassionate towards others. You have to be in a good place yourself before you can start to help others. And I was in a really good place when I got back. And I've got involved with this. I've just completed the mental health first aid uh, training course that I've done with a load of other motorcyclists, ladies, men, young young people um, it, across the whole whole spectrum. And you know, I've learned some really interesting things on that. That one in four people in their life is um, diagnosed with a mental health issue. And what's really sad particularly in the UK, is that um, only 75% 75, 75 of those people don't get any support or any help at all. And that's why becoming a mental health first aider appealed to me, so I can help, if I can only help one person, you know, you've helped somebody. And that not only, it's not about pleasing yourself, it's making sure that somebody else doesn't have to go through the pain and suffering that that you know that you can go through, or you can help them help them at some point and put them in touch with the um, with a, an organisation, be it a professional organisation or some of the brilliant charities that we've got out there, Samaritans and um, Shouts and all these other all these other organisations, depending on what your issue is, whether it being depression, anxiety, eating disorders, psychosis, uh, addiction issues, drink, drugs, etc., gambling, whatever it can be, they're all related to, to mental health. And Absolutely. I've, I've gained so much from that and it was it's uh, I'm quite very pleased to join your group now. I'm so happy to have you. We we do have um over 109 mental health first aiders mm -hmm. um currently and a very long waiting list, um, which I promise to those listening who are on the waiting list, I will I will be trying to get more training done. Yeah, so I did that outside computer centre and you know, and I'm, I'm glad that computer sensor can benefit from that as well. Um, and just talking about that, when I, when, I, when I did come back to work, um, a lot of my colleagues didn't um, didn't know why I hadn't been around for a while. And um, I told them exactly where that what had happened. I, I'd I'd got to a very low point. Um, I didn't want to be around, and um, I'd gone into um, hospital uh, as a result of that. And um, they were absolutely amazed. But they're also amazed about how openly I spoke about it. And I think everybody should be openly speaking about um, about mental health issues or how they're feeling, be it anxiety, depression, which is great while you're doing these podcasts. Um, it's um, and all the other activities that you're trying to promote in Computer Centre. It's brilliant that we've got that um, support in our organisation and that we're promoting it. And, doing the best um, we can to we're promote doing the best it. That and, we can. Yeah. And um, you know, look at how many employees we've got. And that statistic we spoke about earlier, that you know, one in four people is diagnosed with a mental health issue. Think about how many thousands of people that is potentially in computer centre. And we can all support each other. Um 
to uh, to work through that. I mean, I've also been very lucky as well that I've had a um, I've been working through um, my issues and putting plans in place with a, an absolutely brilliant therapist counsellor that I've um, I've worked with over the last twelve months. She actually signed me off last week, so it was a big. Um, we decided there wasn't much else we could do together, but we were introducing um, little little skills and techniques that we've done. I did a lot of CBT analysis with her, uh, cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy, really to work on my issues around uh, self compassion. And when I look back on what we've done, we started out with a therapy blueprint, and um, we worked through various aspects of my personality and how my mind was working. And um, she was so impressed, she said I was like one of the best pupils that she'd had. Not pupils, but, um, <laughs> I felt like a pupil because she was so praising of me. I felt like I was getting a little gold star that we used to have when we were at school and you used to get the teachers used to put in your books. And uh, my wife was a little bit worried that was, she said, there's only you, Andy, could make uh, mindfulness uh, competitive. I wasn't trying to make it competitive at all. <laughs> but I suppose whatever works for you, however you can get through your recovery. And we are like pupils, though, aren't we, when we go to therapy? Because we're yeah. learning. We're learning new skills. We're learning how to adapt to a new way of life as it were. Andy, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Your journey through mental health from a child to adulthood, your recovery is, you know, inspirational. And I hope even, as you said, we can support even just one person to open up, speak out, you know, reach out for help. That's that's all we ask for. But just to finish us off, I have a yeah. question for you. Um, what would your message to your future self be? Message to my future self is that um, some of the best days in our life are still to come. Simple as that. And I'd say that to um, all of my colleagues in Computer Centre um, and I came from a position where I didn't want to be around anymore and I have had some brilliant days in the last 12 months and there'll be a lot more to come and I'm planning another motorcycle trip in six weeks time. Andy, thank you so much. Pleasure. It's honestly been such a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Take and, care. Anybody, anybody wants to talk, they can reach out to me as well. Thank you so much, Andy. Okay, cool.